everyone. Such an exciting evening and program we have in store for you today. I am joined by Dr. Shannon Curry. I'll read her bio and then I will bring her into the stream. So Dr. Curry is a clinical and forensic psychologist with over 15 years of experience in trauma-informed therapy and a specialization in the Gottman method of couples therapy. She is the director of the Curry Psychology Group, which is based in Newport Beach, California. Welcome, Dr. Curry. So great to have you. you here today. What a nice welcome. Hi, guys. I'm Shannon. I'm really happy to be here. I'm excited for questions. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So if anyone has questions for Dr. Curry, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and as many of you guys know, I can't see who's asking the question. So if you want me to know who it is, feel free to just put your name and um, then I can be able to place the person with the question, which is helpful. Um, before we kick things off, we have some great upcoming events, most of which are Facebook Lives. So we have a Facebook Live with Todd Adams. He's the co-host of Zen Parenting Radio coming up on October 6th. We're going to be talking about marriage, parenting, and partnership. And then we have our Pirellian Awards Ceremony coming up on December 11th. Many of you guys know the annual Pirellian Awards celebrate our community and our growth and the friendships that we've built. Um, we've got some new categories this year from the comedian to the contrarian to the most addicted award to the curiosity king or queen and post of the year. So we'll have our initial nominations open on September 30th. You'll have two weeks to put in your nominations and then we'll do a final voting. Um, we hope that everyone participates. You don't have to nominate for every category, so don't feel pressured to. Um, and that is it for our announcements. Okay, so Dr. Curry, my first question for you is, what inspired your career in psychology? <laughs> that is the most impossible question to answer briefly, um, but uh, I can tell you when I made the decision, um, when I made the decision, I was studying pre-med at Georgetown. I had always thought that I was going to be a physician. My dad was a physician. He was an ER doc. And I really loved going with him to the emergency room, actually, when I was a kid. So I would get dressed up on my birthday my birthday is right by Christmas. So wear like the Christmas dress and the tights and shiny shoes and show up at the St. Mary's Long Beach emergency room with my dad. And it it was complete mayhem um, in there. I mean, it was really bad. It's It was a tough neighborhood. There was a lot of violent crime. and um, But what I loved was seeing people helped. And I loved seeing my dad's sense of urgency and his ability to go from being kind of this goofy, cool, musician really which was a volleyball player on the beach to suddenly completely on it um taking care of business knew exactly what to do and um i loved that idea of being present fully engaged having something be so important that there was no way i could flake out on it or get bored um and i think that's what medicine was for him that's what i thought it would be for me and when i was taking the courses it was just brutal. I mean, anybody who was watching who's a phys physician or a nurse or anything really in the physical sciences, good God. I mean, I don't know how you did it. It was so brutal. Uh, and I left Georgetown. I lived on a sailboat. I didn't know what I was going to do. I waited tables for a long time. Um, and I kind of had this like quarter life crisis because I think the message most kids are given these days are that you go to high school, you get really good grades, you take AP courses so you can get into a good college. And isn't that insane to imagine that you would know what you're going to do with your entire life? Even that, that we tie a career to what we're going to do with our life when you're 18 years old. Um, and my dad actually was the one who said to me, just pick anything, pick anything you enjoy. If you enjoy it and you work hard, you will make it your own and the opportunities will naturally arise. And he was 100% right. I picked psychology. I love what I picked, but I have incorporated into psychology, writing and forensic work. I had no idea about the that there is this legal arena. I get to do a lot of social psychology research too. 
I get to do research in different countries. I was interested in international relations and foreign policy and uh, all of those opportunities actually did come up, but they came up. I just picked one thing and worked really hard. And then if you're interested in things, you meet the right people, you make friends with those people. It's natural. It works out. So that is the shortest version. <laughs> as, as you'll find out, I'm not good at short versions of anything, but that's the short version of this story. I love it because I feel like the common theme was purpose and you latched on to being a medical doctor because that's what you were exposed to. Mm -hmm. um, but really it was like the purpose that was important and you found all of these different ways to incorporate into psychology. I know you work with veterans, you work with animals. And yeah. so you well, kind of- You nailed it. I don't yeah. even know if I was that <laughs> aware of that, but you are a hundred percent right. There's a real sense of purpose. Yeah. And that's what my dad meant. He told me that part when I was a kid, just, you're going to have to find something that really matters so that you show up. And um, I think he could relate to that personally. And I have definitely found that throughout my life. There needs to be purpose. Yeah, I feel that so profoundly with the Esther Perel discussion group. It's my passion, That's my so purpose. Cool. And I never could have I predicted. It. It's so neat. You're just so <laughs> lovely. I mean, you're so excited about it. What a cool group, you guys. It's an amazing group. And I'm honored to be a part of it. Um, and to be the, I call myself the chief Pirellian officer. <laughs> well, I am very honored to be here today. This is great. Thanks, Dr. Curry. Um, okay, so my next question is, uh, many of our group members are familiar with the Gottman method of couples mm -hmm. therapy, which is the, sure. one of the methods that you're trained in. And one of the things that's notable about it is it's known for being able to assess within three minutes of an initial interaction if a couple will last with 95% accuracy. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you know, what are the factors the Gottmans look for in those initial interactions that predict romantic longevity? Yeah. God, you guys really know a lot of this stuff. Uh, I mean, I'm, first of all, I don't know if I could assess with 90 plus percent accuracy whether a couple is going to stay together or not. What I do know, and I, but I do know, I mean, John Gottman has been doing this his entire life. Julie Gottman has been doing this her entire life, 40 years of solid research together. So uh, you'd have to ask them what specifically they're looking for within three minutes. I can tell you what the predictors are, the main predictors though. Number one is contempt. So the Gottmans talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which I love because they're so cute and use humor and all of this stuff. And you guys apparently probably know more about this than I do. Uh, but to reiterate, the four horsemen that tend to be the most predictive of a split all go together, but there is the one that's the worst. The worst is contempt. Then we have criticism, defensiveness, and stonewalling. And I'm going to give you antidotes for all of those because I think in the Gottman method in general, it's very positive focus. So we wanna get away from saying what not to do and more about what specifically we can do to make it better. Um, but with contempt, what you're looking at is sort of, it's like criticism on steroids. You're coming at your partner from a position of superiority, not just griping or saying like, you always do that. But with contempt, you're, this would be name calling, eye rolling. There's a real putting them down. Um, and that usually comes when there is immense resentment that's been building for years. Uh, we know that most people don't seek help, don't get couples therapy until six years in. I wish couples therapy, I just wish the Gottman Method were an actual course in school so that it wasn't this really expensive sort of privilege people have because most of the population is going to try to be in a committed long-term relationship and we are flying blind. But that contempt is what happens when we don't know what to do and we're resentful and we feel like our partner is blocking our dreams for years upon years. Um, then you've got criticism, which is just sort of the, you know, just picking at your partner, picking them apart, blaming them for things. So, um, for instance, and actually in most straight couples, women tend to be the ones who criticize more often. And it looks like a woman actually tends to be the one in this dynamic who will also bring up issues to discuss conflict or discuss issues. And what happens when resentment builds or what happens when we don't 
know how to use what we call the gentle startup where you're making yourself vulnerable is instead of saying, sweetheart, I've missed you so much this week. And I know that you just said that you're going to have to um, work late again tomorrow. Uh, I feel like I miss you even more and I feel so disappointed. Do you think we could go on a date this weekend? Would you mind planning a date for us this weekend? That would mean a lot to me. So you're stating what you heard occurred. You just told me you got to work late tomorrow and I haven't seen you all week. And I, and then you're saying a feeling, a vulnerable feeling. I miss you. And then you're giving them a way to shine for you. Instead of saying you're always gone, you don't even care about me, right? Which is safer. I mean, I, you want to kind of throw like a zinger when you're feeling wounded, but instead of trying to put them down and say like, you don't give a shit about it. I, 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 can I swear on this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know, you don't give a shit about our family. You're always working. That's the only thing that's important to you. I have to do everything around here. You're saying, can you plan a date for us? You're giving them an opportunity to shine for you. It's amazing how any person <laughs> will accept that opportunity and rise to the occasion if given if it's clear concise and not about all the ways they're failing so that tends to be the most common dynamic with criticism it's in straight relationships it's the woman bringing it up in terms of in healthier times it'll be just engaging the conflict discussion or this happened let's talk about it when there's resentment it's usually the man starts to turn away which we is the next horseman but the woman will bring up the conflicts in a critical manner now, one of the biggest predictors of staying together is how well a man in a straight relationship is able to accept influence from his partner when she brings up a concern. And you'll see this in what we call the master couple. So maybe even maybe the female partner brought up a concern and she didn't use gentle startup. Maybe she nagged a little. Maybe she was like, oh, you have to work late again. You're never here. There's an incredible little opportunity right there. And what the research has shown over all of these couples is that master couples tend to, the husband will change the direction of the conversation. He'll say, he'll either use levity, some humor, or he'll turn toward the wife and ask her like, are you all right? Have I not been giving you enough attention? You know, I love you. What can I do? Right? Mm -hmm. And now, that's a real mensch right there. There, yeah. I mean, that is like mwah, the perfect husband. Most, I, I don't know if I've seen that that often, but it does exist. And it's something that can absolutely be learned. Mm -hmm. That being said, you're going to wear on your husband's ability if time and time again, yeah. you receive that generosity back or, you know, recognize that it, he made a repair attempt and go with the positive direction. But nonetheless, if a man is willing to turn toward his partner uh, turn toward that need, then that's actually a huge predictor of success. Mm -hmm. What happens when you have too much criticism is the third horseman of the apocalypse. Stonewalling. Stonewalling. <laughs> yeah. And I kind of do this demonstration with couples in my office. I'm like, if, if somebody is telling me everything I've done wrong and how I always do it wrong and that I'm pretty much just a piece of shit who like never makes them happy, and there's no way I can fix it. It just seems totally hopeless. What am I gonna do? Am I gonna be like, tell me more. Let's talk more about this. Or if I am a dutiful partner who wants nothing more than to make my partner happy, am I just gonna be like, I'm just shutting down. Like, I don't even, I don't even know what to say, so I'm just gonna go somewhere else. Yeah. And that's what you see in most heterosexual couples. So. You'll see a male partner who has felt repeatedly shut down. And I keep referencing, by the way, heterosexual couples. And I'm doing that because this is these are the clearest gender roles that have been researched have been within heterosexual yeah. couples. The roles shift a little bit when we're dealing with gay and polyamorous couples. But to just get a clear indication of the research on 10,000 plus couples that were straight showed some interesting gender dynamics mm -hmm. within that dynamic. But for the most part, if anybody is feeling criticized, if anybody's feeling like they're mm -hmm. failing at making their partner happy, eventually you turn away. Yeah. And what we've also found is that when you get too flooded, this tends to be more common in males in general, but you shut down when you turn away. So whereas uh, women have a more of a tendency to lean in, 
-hmm. when they're upset, unless there's trauma there too. And then they all understand the shutdown. Men do stonewalling and that's where you get no response. They shut down, they stop being engaged. They stop asking questions. It's almost like walking on eggshells. Yeah. Um, and then defensiveness and defensiveness, just as I said that a predictor in straight marriages is the man turning toward and accepting his wife's influence. One of those big predictors, one that has a little more power of a split is the husband being defensive, weirdly enough. And that does not, ladies, give us all a pass to be defensive. It just means that that tended to be more associated with the couples that split. And defensiveness is essentially your partner brings up a concern and you have an opportunity in that point, at that point to validate their perspective. Mm -hmm. It does not mean that you agree with them. And it also doesn't mean you're doing one of those half-hearted, crazy making apologies where you're like, I'm sorry you feel that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what it means is that you are essentially, you're saying, um, based on what you're telling me, that you, you know, feel like you haven't seen me all week, even though you may feel like you were there and you may know deep down, you know, you asked if she needed help with this or that, but you would say, based on what you're telling me, your experience is that you feel like you haven't seen me at all this week. I can understand how that would be really disappointing to find out I'm working again tomorrow. And that, and I think it's really nice that you'd miss me. What can I do? So you can continue to have a conversation if you really feel like your partner is getting it wrong, but you can always accept some small portion of responsibility or validate some small mm -hmm. kernel of truth in your partner's statement. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about the criticism horsemen of the apocalypse, um, Esther often quotes the Gottmans when she says behind every criticism is a veiled wish but it's hard to express the wish because it's a lot more vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. Like the missing. Yeah. Yeah. The last thing you want, you want to blast your partner when you're hurt and angry. Right. And you kind of, you have to keep this meta awareness at all times. Like I want this relationship to work. I don't want it to burn it to, to burn it to the ground. You really have an option, but if you're flooded and you're emotional, it's really hard to do that reasoning. In which case take a break. Breaks are always good. A break in in the relationship or oh, in communication. Okay, like the trick is, and actually, so this is one of the main things that comes up early on with my couples is one partner will feel like the other one walks away. Yeah, yeah. We'll have a fight, and I always say walking away is great. It is way better than doing damage yeah. than doing any one of the four horsemen, which you're likely to do if you're flooded. Right. When we talk about flooding. That means that our heart rate is usually up above 100 beats per minute. We are physiologically aroused. Our yeah. endorphins are going. And what happens is that when we go into that kind of fight or flight mode, our frontal lobe, the part of our brain that I always associate with, like, think of your favorite president because it's executive functioning. And think of your favorite president. doesn't have to be anybody else's favorite. It's just your own. Someone you think is like an excellent leader and would know just what to do in any situation. If your executive is asleep, if he's shut down or she's shut down, then you don't have anybody at the helm to tell you, you probably shouldn't say that right now, or maybe don't burn the relationship to the ground. Maybe, maybe sit this one out for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, so the point is, if you're getting flooded, if your heart rate's up, I teach my couples how to pay attention to those physiological feelings, just that feeling of crazy, that feeling like you're, you're exploding a little, or you, you just want to stick it to your partner. Ask for a break, but here's the most important part. When you ask for taking time away, make sure your partner knows that you're going to be back, that you are very specifically, very clearly sta stating, I need a break, but I will be back. Can we talk about this after dinner? Can we talk about this when I get home tonight? Can we talk about this in an hour? Can we come back in 20 minutes? Just give me a minute. Then when you take a break, you do something that distracts you from the issue, the fight. You don't ruminate about your position on things. Yeah. You get clear. You let your heart rate settle. When you come back, you remember you actually care about this person and the relationship working. Yeah. Um, a couple things strike me about that. Number one, I feel like ultimately every interaction is a bid for connection and we can either turn away from our partner or we can assume the best and try to validate that bid. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, so do you, does everybody know what bids are? I mean, are you guys all <laughs> experts in this? It's phenomenal. You can, you can, um, define it maybe just for context. Bids are, bids are little subtle ways that we seek out our partner's attention, affirmation, and affection every day. And um, I want to clarify that it is totally normal to seek out your partner's attention, affirmation, and affection. A lot of times when I am help working with a couple um, and I bring up, you wanted, I might give them the words if somebody has less emotional expressive ability. I'll say, did you want you know, her to, did you want to feel like she was proud of you? And they're like, I don't need her to feel like, I don't need her to give me affirmation. There's nothing wrong with needing that. That is normal. That is the beauty of a committed relationship is having a person bear witness to your life, to be there with you and walk that road. Of course, we want our partner's approval and praise and affirmation. Of course, we want them to admire us. That's also the roots of sexual attraction and passion. So that's all normal and good. And it's okay to ask for that. We need to get more comfortable using words to say, hey, are you, do you like what I just did? Look at this. And then for, and also we need to get better at recognizing our partner's nonverbal bids too, because there are a lot of things our partner does uh, that we miss. And every time we miss one of those bids, we're taking a major draw out of this emotional bank account that buoys the relationship. And you guys probably already know about all of these ratios we have, but when you're in a time of conflict with your partner, there are to be five times you're either responding positively to a bid, acknowledging your partner, giving them a compliment, expressing fondness and appreciation, showing caring five different times to every one you miss everyone you miss um, in times that are good weirdly enough that ratio increases you have to do 20 positive things for every negative and here's why if things are going great in your relationship and then there's suddenly a rupture it's kind of jarring and it throws off the it you're out of sync um, it's not as normalized you almost get kind of normalized to the tension and criticism and conflict when you're in a tough time but when you're in a good time, you actually are going to have to rebuild with 20 more positives. So you really want to learn how to recognize those bids in your partner. And you know what's going to drive me crazy is I just had a list of bids on my desk and I was cleaning up my desk. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. There it is, guys. Oh, I got them. Oh, great. I'm so excited. Okay. This is the Gottman's list of bids. Okay. I think it's upside down. <laughs> I give this to couples early on yes. when they start with me because I think it's fascinating. I, there are so many things on here that even when I first met my husband, I didn't realize things he did were certain were bids. And um, I, sweet Ty, he, he does so many nonverbal ones, and they used to annoy the hell out of me because I didn't know they were bids. I just and the things I would think and the judgments I would have. Because I was like, why, what do you, why do you need me to look up to what I have to like apply real yeah. critical yeah, yeah, and yeah. not recognizing he probably, I, we've probably had a 35 minutes, 35 minutes of conversation in the entire week. And it's all been task related or to do yeah. list. Related. And this poor guy is just trying to connect with me because he loves me. So I can look up for my damn email and acknowledge, you know, the meme he wants to show me or the fact he just read about in the news, or some fact he wants to give me about the show he's watching that I have no interest in whatsoever, but I do have interest in him. 100%. Um, someone just asked if you could read maybe two or three of the most like creative, I'd love, creative ones. I'd love to guys. Okay, so I'm gonna respond to, or I'm gonna read some of the ones that I feel like people don't know are okay. Great. That people feel most uncomfortable with, but that are actually bids and just mean that your partner loves you and values you and you matter. Um, pay attention to what I say. So examples of this on the list are, how do I look? Hey, did you see that squirrel? Okay, which may just sound like, God, she doesn't shut up or he doesn't shut up or, ugh, I'm trying to focus on the show. Bids perfection. Um, responding to simple requests, requests for help like, 
Could you take the dog for a walk? Um, while you're up, can you grab me a glass of water? This is actually one with me and Ty. He, uh, he told me that it makes him feel cared about if I ask the poor guy if he wants a glass of water when I get one. I hadn't even thought of that because I, I'm way more selfish than he is. But simple things make us feel cared about. Um, and ask if your partner is asking you to do something like that, too. It's, hey, do you care about me? Do you love me as much as I love you? Um, I want to read all of them, but let's see. Show interest or active excitement in my accomplishments. When your partner cooks something for you and they ask you how it is, guys, that's a bid. It's a big one. Like, how was that? Right? You, I tell Ty, because Ty does all the cooking because he is wonderful. I'm like, that was the most amazing meal I have ever had in my life. And honestly, it was because if it weren't for him, it would be peanut butter and jelly and wine. <laughs> um, respond to my joke. Mm -hmm. Guys, girls, if anybody, if your partner tells you a joke, just respond to it. You don't even have to laugh. I've learned this from experience because Ty is Australian and his humor is super different than mine. But just look up. Even if you want to say the joke is a bad joke with some levity, um, you can just acknowledge. Do not ignore. And then I'll, the last one, uh, be affectionate. Like, come cuddle with me while I read. Partners have different uh, – everybody's different with their level of comfort. But one thing that uh, the research that Gottman's done has shown time and time again is that those couples who show physical affection, even in public, have the most satisfying sex lives. Um and if your partner is somebody who feels cared about when you show physical affection, you want to make sure you do that and meet that need. Yeah. And I could even see taking this list a step further by talking through the different like categories of bids and oh, showing right. like, this is what would be like, most meaningful for me. Yeah. yeah. And we do lists. So what I have couples do is we create, it's called the caring days checklist mm -hmm. and they formulate what makes them feel cared about. So we kind of, Think of it like a course. That's what the Gottman Method of Couples Therapy pretty much is. So show them this. We learn about bids. And then we create this chart where they figure out what their own bids are. And they're thinking about themselves. And sometimes they're better at knowing what their partner's bids are and helping their partner make their list. And that's also a really loving thing when you realize your partner knows you better than you know yourself. So I just love the exercise. And then with the Caring Days checklist, the goal is that each partner does two things per day that make the other one feel cared about from the other one's list of things. And they can choose any option. Partners come up with 20 different possibilities. And these are small little things like asking Ty if he wants a freaking glass of water. And you don't check off when you do it because it's not a tit for tat. Like I do all these things. What it is is you check it off when your partner does it for you. So you're really starting to appreciate all the small ways that they're meeting your needs showing you they care, thinking about you, loving you. Yeah, I could see this being a really meaningful part of a weekly ritual or check-in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. And I'll tell you, nothing turns things around faster than your partner doing a couple sweet things from your list every day, like a little text or, oh my gosh, it, it, the goodwill just blossoms in the friendship. 100%. Um, I know a lot of people come to our community after a challenging relationship or in the midst of a breakup or just navigating tough relational issues. And one thing I've noticed is when people have either one big tough relational experience or a series in a row, say if they're dating, it can be, it can be vulnerable to, um, uh, to ask for bids for connection because oh, we yeah. associate it with, um, you know, being ghosted or being rejected or right. being shut down. Right. And I, I'm curious what advice you would have to people who are feeling a little bit like guarded and protected of, um, of having those bids with new partners because of past experiences. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the nature of bids is that we tend to do them automatically, whether we're being intentional or not. Um, what I'm hearing you describe, and I could be wrong, is sort of the oh, the generalized feeling of being very protective and closed off and not wanting to share much of yourself at all, or even maybe be open within the relationship or vulnerable. Um, is that correct? Is that what you're talking about after there's um, been rest? 
I guess there can be different scenarios, but maybe associating with associating certain bids that you really enjoy, whether it's like telling a joke or being on the receiving end of like someone offering you a glass of water, like associating it with past traumatic relational experiences. And so kind of being a little bit timid or trepidatious about about where it hasn't been met in the past. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. So I think one of the, the if you've been in a relationship in the past and there's been, I mean, a, we have all different levels of an unsatisfying relationship, right? So there can be one where it's just didn't work out and there were misbids. We have the, some of the best relationships where there are misbids and some great relationships where there's a lot of conflict, but there's always repair and the repair is really healthy and the conflict stays healthy and not contemptuous. Then we've got abusive relationships where there are insane power differentials and somebody is truly being um, stripped of their power, their strength and well-being. In those cases, you know, depending on where we are on the spectrum, you're going to see more and more of these missed bids, things that or needs not being fulfilled, even your own personhood not being recognized, depending on where we are. So absolutely, I think in any relationship, if we find ourselves leaving one that's bad and we're in a new one that we feel personally is healthy, I myself have had the experience of gently easing into something or, God, I, I know that there have been some things with Ty where I've been surprised, like, oh my God, I just remembered that, um, you know, he wouldn't share food with me or he'd get mad if I ate his food, you know, something like that because of something he has done for me that I haven't asked for mm -hmm. because I was almost conditioned to shut it off or think of it as a bad habit of mine or, you know, something that I had learned in an un a very unhealthy relationship was not okay for me to ask for or do. Wow. And um, I wasn't even aware of it. But then when my partner in my healthy, lovely marriage extended that offer to me or responded differently to me if I did something automatically without thinking, um, I found that to be a really healing, corrective experience. Yeah. Uh, I think relationships are our best teachers and the best we can do is become gradually aware of our own hesitations, do our best to when we have evidence that we're with a safe person to discuss with them and let allow them to support us in that mm -hmm. journey. You don't have to be 100% healed to be in a relationship. You can do that with another person. Yeah. It's so funny because um, I, I love Bernice Mountain Dogs. And there's one in particular that I sit for, usually for like an extended stay. Yeah. Well, his parents are on vacation. And um, this guy, I told my dad the other day, I'm like, dad, this is the closest to a grandchild you'll ever get. Because <laughs> he'll, he'll usually I like join me. In the same boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I was kind of trying to think about what is it about this particular dog that I connect with so profoundly. And I feel like he is the version of me, like before all the relational hurt happened, kind of like the most authentic version yeah. of me. And I like see that in him and he hasn't had like the experiences that make him kind of more guarded um, or um, project kind of like negative things happening down the road before they happen. Mm -hmm. And it's it was a cool experience because I'm so in love with this dog and it helps me like feel more in love with myself, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, dogs. So I used to, I really love working with dogs. I love incorporating them in therapy. I used to work at a mental hospital where we had an animal assisted therapy program and trained um, certified therapy dogs that would visit the units. And we kept them at the hospitals during the day. And then they came home with one of the staff at, in the evening. And the research is just so profound. I mean, dogs and humans have really evolved together. And I, I have my own beliefs over time and working with dogs and with clients and having my own dogs. I mean, they really connect us to the present moment too. And in the present moment, um, I mean, I think one of the things that's so beautiful about them is they don't, 
attach layers and layers of thinking and judgments to their experiences. If they're in pain, they're in pain in that moment. And, you know, an hour later, they're not reflecting back on the pain they were in for a moment an hour ago and then feeling sorry or victimized or like that I shouldn't have been in pain, right? Or telling these stories of themselves that become these narratives we have that then really keep us stuck. I think there's something so beautiful about their purity, their ability to think everything is the best, no matter what it is. Oh, oh my God, grandma's here, that's the best. Oh my God, we're gonna go on a drive, that's the best. Oh my God, we're coming home, that's the best. They are so present in the moment. Um, they don't attach anything to their identity, they just are there. They are there enjoying the experience and whatever arises. Um, and there is such a purity to that. I think it reminds us of who we truly are. Yeah. Um, I think that I hear that in what you're saying um, in our own groundedness and ability to just be loving and pure and good and and lovable. We are all, all very lovable when we strip away all of those attachments and fears. Yeah, he's also like so good at receiving. <laughs> Like he loves to be just adored yeah. and sh showered with attention. And so, you know, we'll come across people on the street and he's like a very handsome guy. And so everyone wants to say hi and he'll like immediately sit with like the biggest smile and his tongues out and just like soak it in. And I oh love that God, about him. Oh, <laughs> I love dogs so much. You're killing me. I love them so much. But even thinking about a dog actually has been shown to like gets your oxytocin going helps relieve stress. I mean, they are great medicine. They're yeah. good medicine. Um, going back to what we were talking about before, mm -hmm. I was curious, let's say, let's say several of the four horsemen are present in a dynamic. Mm -hmm. Once they're present, is it too late? Or can, um, can the, the horsemen be like reverse by mm -hmm. gaining awareness about what's going on, the resentment, tr trying to like equilibrate the resentment. Oh yeah, yeah, let me, <laughs> let me make sure everybody knows here. We all have the four horsemen in our relationships. Like I don't want anybody, everybody's miserable. This is the gift of being a therapist, by the way, is you get, honestly, one of the greatest gifts of being a therapist aside from having i once described it as like getting to have awesome conversations with my friends all day who i love very much like it's the best job ever but also any misnomers you had in life about other people being happier or having it all together or the perfect marriage none of that is true we are all absolutely in this together all of us marriage is hard relationships are hard every no i mean i love my friends who lay it all out and turn it into humor because we are all in it together and i also really needed to know that there was a point to monogamy and not necessarily monogamy but commitment to trying so hard with one person for years and years because i had a failed marriage in the past with somebody i love very much and if you've been divorced before it's horrific it's awful it is awful even if you're the one initiating it um, but anyhow, I needed to know that there was a way to be in love long-term that you weren't just going to settle for companionship if that's not what you wanted. Um, and that, you know, you wouldn't feel like you were giving something major up, like, you know, your youth, your sexiness <laughs> to commit to a person. And what I found with the Gottman research was that no, absolutely you can be happy long-term. Absolutely, you can still have passion. You can have the greatest sex of your life with somebody you've been having sex with for 40 plus years. There are specific skills that we never learned. We've changed the rules of the game when it comes to marriage. It truly used to be about land and agriculture and power. Now, it, you know, we're marrying for love and we're living longer than ever, ever. but we have no idea what the hell we're doing. So I want everybody to know, like, think about how hard it is to get along with a, I don't know if you've ever had a house guest before, for like a couple days and they start to get on your nerves. You're living with this person for years and years. Of course, it is going to be miserable and you're going to have questions and wonder if you're with the right person and made a terrible mistake and need to blow your whole life apart and break it up. We all have those thoughts. We are all struggling. 
all of us get defensive. All of us are critical of our partners. The bottom line is when we have those, you know, those negative ratio numbers, do we know how to repair them? Mm -hmm. And do we have the skills to use antidotes or better ways of doing things? For instance, I didn't know how to do gentle startup before. And I have couples who really are struggling with that, really lovely couples who want to communicate. They don't know how to say things to each other in a way that doesn't trigger the other person. It always sounds like an insult because they just didn't learn the formula of using an actual emotion word, a neutral observation, and then a positive way that the partner can shine for you. So yes, this stuff can be repaired. It can be taught. It can be learned. It's all very exciting, guys. Awesome. And I know the Gottmans have tons of literature in addition to their therapy training module if people are curious and kind of want just a little a little nugget to learn more. Um, I was curious if you could watch uh, ask the Gottmans any question, what would you ask them? Do you love me? <laughs> that would be my question. I love them so much. <laughs> There's no that I, I um God. They are so um, transparent. They share so much. I feel like I honestly, it would be like, can we go on vacation together? <laughs> Will you mentor me? Do you know I'm like, are you proud of me? I just, I admire them both so much. And I think they're lovely. Julie's trauma work too, as an individual is so profound. And she has such a gift. I could watch her do therapy all day. I find uh, my cadence kind of slows and I get really um, present with my clients just after I watch a video of her. Um, it would honestly be like, can we hang out? I love that. Um, I listened to a couple interviews that they did. One was with Brene Brown and then another is with a woman, Dr. Alexandra Solomon, who's a longstanding group member and a friend of Astaire's. Wow. It was great. She just interviewed. And then you know, they were talking about how their new grandparents and how the act of like, what, you know, they've been together for a, a very long time, I think mm -hmm. like 40 years, the act of like watching them from afar as a grandparent in this new role is like this new layer of erotic energy that they're bringing to their connection, which is like exactly what Astaire yeah. talks about. It's yeah. really beautiful. Yeah. They're so cute. I love them. And I love, I mean, really... There's so much they offer through their going through their shared experience as a married couple with the knowledge they have, I think is really profound. When they share their experiences, there's so much insight there and it's all based on this foundation of evidence. So it's really rich data for what we can look for in our own relationships. Some of the most helpful things, I think, you know, I've been learning the Gottman method for 10 years, I think, mm -hmm. and practicing it. Um, but the things that stand out most in my mind are like a, a story that John Gottman shared about one night, um, you know, seeing that Julie was upset about something and he had really just wanted to go sit down and read a book. I think they'd had a long training weekend or something. And he had that opportunity then to either turn away from her and pretend he didn't see it. And he had some criticisms of her and like, why is there is always, a, you know, something. Um, and he could have done that or... He could turn toward her and really trust what they this beautiful oak tree they're building and growing and um and he decided to turn toward her and he you know step, put his toe in and just said like what's going on you look upset and she just started sobbing and you know really leaned into him and um it made him feel so loved and important and uh I, I love those antidotes. They really help me when I'm having that moment where Ty is doing his little left. That means I'm supposed to look up because he's going to show me a meme and I just want to finish the email. And I know like this is that moment where you just wanted to read a book. I just wanted to finish the email, but I'm going to turn toward him. It's worth it. That's beautiful. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. <laughs> I think I would be like the you in the relationship. Everybody can relate to this stuff. I think that's why it's so beautiful. And I love the Gottmans for making it so personable. Yeah, 100%. I heard that they have a brand new book out that's kind of a culmination of a lot of the research that they've done. I hope you know about it. <laughs> what is it? Um, it's called The Love Prescription. I think oh, God. I haven't heard about this, but I've been very busy, so I have an excuse. Okay, amazing. Well, I, we'll share nuggets of it. In the group. 
Yeah. And you guys, uh, you guys know more about all of this stuff than I do. It's I'm finding out. I mean, your guys' knowledge about this is incredible. Yeah, we're, we really geek out on it. It's um, so adorable. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It's so funny because the whole reason I started this group was uh, this was back like five years ago. I had just been ghosted in a pretty painful way. And I happened to be at an event a few days later where I saw a stare. And she gave like a 20 minute talk um, and she ended her talk with this line. It's one of my favorite lines of hers in dating and relationships were often picked for a role that we didn't audition for. Oh, wow. And I realized that I had picked this guy for a role that he was not interested in. He picked yeah. me for a role that I had zero interest wow. in. Right. And it was so profound. And I just wanted to like talk about it with people. And yeah. You know, I have a lot of smart friends, but relationships are kind of an acquired taste. And mm -hmm. I started this group on a total whim, thinking, it, like, you know, it would just go in the black hole of Facebook groups that were started. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, a lot of other people out there were dying to talk about. <laughs> to, I, to talk yeah, about. like I said, I mean, 96% of the population is going to try to get married or have a long term commitment. We're all just flying blind. So, when we hear these little nuggets that ring true, they're really, really helpful. Yeah. And and I love that quote because I'm thinking one of the biggest uh, you know, barriers for a lot of my couples is they come in with this sort of blueprint that they've learned mostly from like Hollywood movies on what a relationship should look like and what yeah. people are supposed to deliver and how they're supposed to be and what respect means. And we're really forcing each other into roles that have nothing to do with the individual mm -hmm. individual story, who they are, what they're sensitive to, what they're able to provide. And, and I think in a lot of cases, I see really wonderful potential partners get pushed away because of these totally arbitrary ideas of what a good partner looks like or should be doing. And, and it's a real shame. Yeah, I can see that for sure. Um, okay, we're running out of time. I think the last question I want to ask you about is I came across your work through um, a prominent uh, trial. Um, <laughs> and I was curious if you could share. So you're a forensic psychologist, which means that you're often brought on as an expert witness to analyze someone who's part of a, a, a case. Well, it can mean a couple different things. So sometimes I'm brought on as a consultant and I said consultant, weird, but sometimes I'm brought on as a consultant. So I would essentially be sort of behind the scenes talking to the legal team about a certain psychological issue or topic that might be helpful to them, in which case I have no role in the courtroom or doing any sort of evaluation. But for the most part, what you're right. So I'm brought on as an expert. In most cases, I conduct an evaluation of one or both individuals and then provide a report. Um, most people never see the report. Usually the report just goes to the court. And um, then I provide testimony based on what's provided in that report. So fascinating. Yeah. I watch a lot of Lifetime true story movies. And I think it's because I, first of all, in my own life, I like very little drama. Yeah. And so I think I meet my need for like emotional intensity. <laughs> I 100% think that's true. So many people I know watch um, investigation discovery and true crime stuff and lifetime drama. And I don't want to touch any of it. I'm just done. Like, done. <laughs> I hear people talking about a true crime thing. I almost feel like, oh, <laughs> like, do I need to correct that? I mean, it's too close to home. I just don't even want to hear it. <laughs> It stresses me out. Like it's just a work thing. A hundred percent. I also love the anticipation, like trying to pick up clues and see, oh, I think this person is going to behave in this way and they're going to respond to X person's action by doing this. So it's kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of yeah, a bit so of a mind. Like profiling. And that's one of the biggest myths actually about what forensic psychology is. Forensic psychology is so much more boring. I mean, I don't think it's boring. I think it's fascinating, but it is definitely not um, all salacious like people yeah. think. There's no real like guesswork, like, ooh, the murderer brought like mm -hmm. this and likes dolls. It's actually just like, 
here is the statistical data from this test. And when I paired this data with this data, and this has this norm group, and then here's the 75 page report with a gazillion citations in it. Like it's really um, precise yeah. and mathematical. And, and it is funny because I remember being interested initially in forensics and, um, you know, thinking I'd be like fist pumping with prisoners. Yeah. And there is some of that, especially in your early training days. But really, like when you're called as an expert, it's boring. <laughs> the one thing that really stood out to me about you during the trial is, and I might have gotten this wrong, but like how much you loved the educating piece of being on the stand, yeah. Yeah. like helping other people understand about how we work as human beings was like yeah. really motivating to you. Yeah, well, I really like, um, I really, uh, I think it's really a sacred role that we're given when we're brought in to assist the court. It's, it is not about us. It's not about either party. You've been asked a very specific question by the court and your job is to answer that question for the court. And then you let the court decide their answer to the, we call it the ultimate legal issue. Mm -hmm. But my role is to educate you're you're there to as it, the quote is assist the fact finder provide scientific information educate so that they can make a final decision on the legal issue and that education is so important it's important that it's thorough it's important that it's accurate that it's steeped in research and evidence and really careful methods of examination and um and also the, i mean you guys can tell i'm a talker but when you're immersed in an evaluation or a really trying case you're working on it all day long and it's like all you're thinking about and so it's really fun to finally be able to talk about it and um and like finally communicate all the stuff that's been in your own private little world on your laptop typing and in your head as you analyze 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 for months yeah, I could see it going back to what we started our conversation with, which is like the purpose. Yeah. And it's doing that work. It's like that higher purpose, like yes. justice. And yeah, um, yeah, I was I curious. Yeah, I was curious what for you, what was the most meaningful part of participating in the trial? And what was the hardest or most challenging part? Well, you just touched on the meaningful part. The meaningful part was feeling um, like, uh, I mean, it, it, in terms of forensic work, it was incredibly intellectually challenging. It was extremely demanding. It pushed me um, further, I think, than I've ever been pushed intellectually in terms of the time at the labor, uh, the type of critical thinking that I needed to do, the memorization, the integrating multiple different pieces of research data, psychometric data. And um, I, I mean, I was, constant that was the most meaningful part i felt like every one of my strengths was kind of had come alive was lit wow. up and um so that was deeply fulfilling in being able to um assist in that manner and feel um i never really felt capable in fact i i never do when it's high stakes like that i i feel like i am about to just face global humiliation but um but there were times where I definitely felt immersed, passionate, invested, um, and careful and cautious. Like I, I will leave no stone unturned. And it's very satisfying to produce, you know, a massive report that encapsulates all of your findings and integrated thinking. That was very satisfying. I think the challenge was um, being misunderstood. I think the challenge was, um, uh my opinion science very scientific opinions um being politicized and um things being said about me that weren't true i'm very sensitive to that mm -hmm. um that has been difficult uh but i i wouldn't change it i think um i mean there are risks inherent with any forensic case you take whether it's a safety risk whether it's um, your reputation being damaged because somebody doesn't like the opinion you made. Um, that's very common actually in family law and custody disputes. Um, but in civil cases, it's, it's also a big risk. Somebody, yeah. and also that's why it is so important to be thorough and really take it as a sacred duty because 
it is going to impact people's lives very significantly. And um, so, yeah, it's not something you take lately. I think that was tough. Wow. I never thought of all of those different elements that you just shared. Um, but I, I'm so grateful that the trial exposed me to your work and that you're a part of our community. And I hope to learn more from you from your Instagram lives and the other content that you're putting out. So please tell everyone where they can find you and how they can connect with you. So um, you're welcome to visit uh, my website, careerpsychology.com. And um, we have a lot of information on there about what I do, what my team does. Um, any speaking engagements, you can inquire through the website, forensic cases, um, inquire through the website. And, um, and I'm a member of this group now, I think. So that's exciting. Thank you so much, Dr. Curry. Our time Thank is the most so valuable much. thing we have. And I know you're so busy and I'm just so grateful that that's you took, right. an, took an hour out of your day to share with us. And I hope the information we shared is helping people have better, healthier, stronger relationships. So thank you again. Um, you are such a little, just sweet, bright light. You're so, I mean, you are like the Bernese Mountain. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. This is so fun for me. Um, I've seen the comments. People are saying thank you so much. Um, we so appreciate much. you. And um, okay, everyone, we'll catch you guys in the group soon. Have a great night. Bye, Bye guys. guys. Bye, everyone.